drop it. All right, fun power panel for you guys. Young Turks, Cenk Uger, Ravana, Yasmin Khan, both of them, Rebel Headquarters contributors. Great to have you guys on. Yasmin is also the host of Modern Context Podcast. Great to see you both. Thank you, glad to be back. All right, excellent. So guys, fun show ahead for you all. Trump concedes on two different things, runs a little bit of mock, 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 mock action. Uh, we got that in both hours, uh, and then the war on librarians continue because that's the top problem in the country. Uh, and then later in the program, uh, a Nick Fuentes fan decides to take on a Jewish MMA fighter. How did it turn out? You're gonna want to see. All right. Now, having said that, Ravana, you take it away. Yeah, so I'm sure everyone out there is just as disappointed as I am to hear the news of something we were all very excited to learn about was Trump's uh, his pressing information that the irrefutable claims of election uh, fraud out of Georgia. He was gonna host a huge press conference on Monday to discuss them, but now it's canceled. And he posted to his social media site, Truth Social, why it was canceled. And apparently it's the first time in his entire life that he's decided to actually take the advice of his attorneys. Because he posted this, rather than releasing the report on the rigged and stolen Georgia 2020 presidential election on Monday. My lawyers would prefer putting this, I believe, irrefutable and overwhelming evidence of election fraud and irregularities in formal legal filings as we fight to dismiss this disgraceful indictment by a publicity and campaign finance seeking DA who sadly presides over a record breaking murder and violent crime area, Atlanta. Therefore, the news conference is no longer necessary. Uh, but the New York Times said that the report that Trump was expected to release was a hundred plus page document compiled by one of his communications aides, who is said to be a true believer in the former president's claims that the election was rigged and stolen. Apparently, that communications aide has drank the Kool Aid because how do you even, how are you a true believer in something like that? I will never understand. Uh, someone else who apparently doesn't understand is Jordan Peterson, because he tweeted this out. What is going on? I mean, and Jenk, that was my thought because to be honest, I was surprised that Donald Trump was actually going to take the advice of his lawyers who I'm sure have been trying to get him to shut up about this kind of stuff for quite some time. Yeah, no, I'm actually not surprised. And I explained why yesterday, even before he made this decision. Because the Donald Trump has on a couple of occasions relented when literally everyone in the room says not to do it. Uh, gave a couple examples like he wanted to increase the American nuclear supply by tenfold, which would have bankrupted the country. Uh, and, uh, and he wanted to basically, he was discussing martial law and rolling in the tanks after the election. And everyone in his administration, almost everyone in his administration, other than the guys who were indicted, said they would resign immediately if he uh, did that. And he chose not to do it. So there are a couple of occasions when people can talk him out of it, but they have to be near unanimous and overwhelming. So, but he has put himself in a very bad situation here because at the same time, his lawyers went to court just now and said, "Oh, we would love for this trial to start in 2026, 2026, so two and a half years from now." And so why do you need two and a half years to prepare if Donald Trump has an irrefutable case that he was gonna put together on Monday? So if you've got an irrefutable evidence, you're gonna win this case super easily. And he says he has it. So Mega, I'm gonna ask you guys one more time, does he have it or doesn't he have it? Because if he has it, they should go to trial tomorrow. Trump says he's ready. And remember, you guys all said you already have the evidence. And if he has evidence that the election was stolen, all the cases that are regarding that, Atlanta, the federal prosecution, he wins immediately because they're predicated on the fact that he lost. If he won, he wins. So now you all know, and I mean, that's why I think it's kind of interesting Jordan Peterson tweeted that. I mean, <laughs> maybe Trump's doing what he said he was going to do with Muslims. We got to just stop everything until we figure out what the hell is going on, okay? But 
does is Peterson so unintelligent that he doesn't know that of course Trump was lying, he doesn't have any evidence and all he was going to do is implicate himself more with even dumber lies. Is there still anyone left in the country who genuinely thinks the election was stolen and Trump has the mules in his garage? He's just not going to release it. He's going to do it. Oh, God, oh, golly, Jim. He's going to put the mules back in the garage and wait for the trial two and a, in his wishes two and a half years from now. No way, no way. You guys all know he doesn't have any goddamn evidence. He's a liar and a crier. And if you don't know that by now, you're in a world of trouble. You live on a different planet. Yasmin. Yeah, you know, is Jordan Peterson so unintelligent? Well, you know what his supporters are going to say, of course not. It's impossible for somebody like Jordan Peterson to be unintelligent because he has all these accolades and all these degrees and he's a college professor and everything like that. But Jordan Peterson is a great example of the fact that you can be very, very educated and still have major blind spots as to what is going on in the country. Everyone can see what is actually going on in the country. And with Trump specifically with this evidence that he keeps teasing and you know we still have never seen it. It's kind of like, it kind of makes me feel like people who predict the rapture and then whenever it doesn't happen, then they're like, oh, it's coming later, it's coming later, it's coming later. It's kind of baffling to me that these people still have any kind of faith whatsoever that Trump has this evidence, this irrefutable evidence that for some reason, none of us have ever seen. If he had it, we would have seen it a million times by now. and it. it not everything is a conspiracy, right? Not everything is this huge conspiratorial agenda that's, you know, out to get whoever. I don't even know. I can't even keep up with their stuff anymore. But it's kind of, you know, like Trump supporters are always going on, they're always mad about Occam's razor because maybe that flies in the face of the fact that everything to them has to be conspiratorial because none of it makes any sense. The simple example or the simple explanation for any of this is not in their favor, doesn't work in their favor. So they have to make it more and more complicated. And it sounds like somebody who's lying, right? The more complex your lie is, the more untrue it probably is. And we know that every child can tell you that, but these Trump supporters seem like they haven't really learned that lesson. Right, and unfortunately for Trump, this was only one of the things he was getting a lot of backlash for this week. This is the only first instance of his backpedaling because it was uh, only yesterday that he posted this regarding his attendance at the debate on the 23rd. He said on his social media site to social, many people are asking whether or not I will be doing the debates. All Americans have been clamoring for a president of extremely high intelligence. <laughs> As everyone is. I'm sorry. Okay, it continues. As everyone is aware, my poll numbers over a quote wonderful field of Republican candidates are extraordinary. In fact, I am leading the runner up, whoever that may now be, by more than 50 points. Reagan didn't do it, and neither did others. Reagan at all, apparently. People know my record, one of the best ever. So why would I debate? I'm your man, make America great again. And so Donald Trump wants a president of extremely high intelligence. Um, so let's just play this clip of him displaying his extremely high level of intelligence. But right, and then I see the disinfectant where it knocks it out in a minute, one minute. And is there a way we can do something like that uh, by injection inside or, or Almost a cleaning because you see it gets on the lungs and it does a tremendous number of the lungs. I mean, Jake, he set himself up yeah. <laughs> for this one. 100%. Look, uh, I give many examples because there's literally hundreds of examples of uh, Donald Trump's incredibly low IQ. Uh, my favorite example is he took the dementia test. Uh, that's the one where they, you see if you can remember five words and other simple things like, hey, what animal is this? And it's like a giraffe or a lion, right? And he came out and he's like, it showed, I remember the five words. I knew the animals. It shows I'm a very stable genius. No, it shows that you're a moron who doesn't even realize you're, that he's taking a dementia test. Like that ends the conversation. No, like it's not just MAGA guys; it's dumbasses on television that keep treating him as if he's an intelligent guy. He's just a moron who likes lights. He's like spotlight. I like it. Camera light. I like it. I run towards lights. I say things. Verbal diarrhea. Uh, and I'm, and by the way, if you're saying, oh yeah, well then the Democrats couldn't beat him. You're totally right. That's why I can't. 
stand how weak the Democratic Party is. This guy, max 70 IQ, max, okay? He thought that the stealth fighters were invisible to the naked eye. He thought it was like Wonder Woman's jet, you can't see it. He said it out loud twice, okay? Now on that clip, I mentioned it in a tweet on, on X or Y or whatever that thing is called. And uh, and right where he's like, no, that's not true. He didn't, no, it's a media hoax. He didn't say bleach into the lungs. He said uh, disinfectant to clean out the lungs. That's what you're hanging your hat on? <laughs> okay, do you know that Donald Trump is still hiding his college grades and his high school grades? And he has threatened to sue anyone trying to get them? How pathetically embarrassing are your high school grades that you're still hiding them as a grown ass man in his 70s? Who cares how you did in high school? But obviously, he's mortified. He doesn't want you to find out. Part of the reason why is not just that he's a dumb dumb, that is obvious to everyone except MAGA. It's that if you find out how awful he was in school and how awful his every score he's ever taken is, you'll realize it was his daddy who got spoiled little Donnie everything he's ever gotten. He got him into schools, he, got, he started him in business, gave him four over 400 million dollars, and he's just spoiled little brat. And now you can talk about it. The Americans need a president with high intelligence. I couldn't agree more. God, I'd love one, right? The last one we had, look, I, I'm not super high on Biden's intelligence either, but he's nowhere near this guy. This guy can barely function, and he has the nerve to talk about high intelligence. And guys, that's what is amazing to me. Like, he doesn't get it at all, just like the dementia test. He thinks, <laughs> you know what? Passing a dementia test means I'm really smart. He really doesn't get how painfully stupid he is. I remember that dementia test. It's so funny that you mentioned that. That was the funniest thing when it first came out. And all of his supporters who were like, look, look, this proves it. He's not an idiot. And it's like, why would you need proof that someone's not an idiot? If they're not an idiot, everyone would just know that they're not an idiot and no one would require proof. And then of course, the irony of the dementia test being his his benchmark for his intelligence is hilarious. But just the idea that Americans are clamoring for an intelligent president and we are clamoring then for Donald Trump to be the next president as a way of finding our intelligence again as a nation is ridiculous, right? It doesn't make any sense. Donald Trump, even his own aides used to say that they used to have to dumb down their memos to him, right? They would give him pages of literature, he wouldn't read it. So they would write it out in bullet points, like what you would give to a child to explain very, very detailed and very complex, you know, even foreign affairs and even domestic relations. Everything that a president should be able to handle, he couldn't handle it. He would ask for pictures and things like that. You know, he likes to see pictures like an actual child. But, you know, as far as the debate, I think I was talking about this with John on the damage report a while ago whenever he was saying maybe he will, maybe he won't do the debate. And I was just like, who cares if he does the debate or not, right? His supporters don't care, we don't care because he has nothing new to say. He's been saying the same exact thing for the past five or so years, if not longer, right? We've heard all of his talking points. He has nothing new. Even this press conference that he said he was gonna give, has he has no new information, right? It would only be lies because that's all he, he, he has. That's all he has is lies. We know that he has no evidence for the things that he's saying. So we know that whatever he says on a debate stage or at a press conference or at a rally is going to be a lie. And right now, he literally can't afford to, you know, three years and nine, 91 indictments later, he can't afford to tell any more lies. Yeah. I'll add, it'll impact me if he doesn't do the debate, but only in so much as it'll change the rules I'm making for my Republican primary debate drinking game, because that's the <laughs> only way I can get through that. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I think I'm gonna play the, and we're gonna cover it for you guys. So make sure right after the Republican debate, come watch us on the Young Turks and we'll give you an analysis. But I might, instead of doing a drinking game, do an edible game so that I get high two hours later. Uh, anyways, 
<laughs> okay, seriously, guys, I like what Yasmin is saying. It, you know that normally you need proof of life when someone's kidnapped. Here, uh, we need proof of IQ, just a single IQ point for Trump to go forward. But we're not sure we're going to get one. Remember when he became president and he was like, "I'm going to solve health care." He said on the campaign trail, "Got no problem, easy. So I'm going to solve it, whatever solving health care means, right?" And then he comes in, they're like, "Okay, why come you didn't solve it?" And he's like, "Turns out no one knew this, but health care is complicated." No, dude, everybody knew that the healthcare situation in America is complicated. You're the only moron who didn't. And okay, let's put aside his intelligence, but that's, and he's obviously empirically wrong that Americans need proof of intelligence. We elected him, so apparently we didn't need that proof, let alone Bush, let alone Reagan, let alone all those guys. But, uh, but finally, look, MAGA, here's uh, something that you guys can, it's hard for you to disagree with this. He ran twice now. He said he had irrefutable evidence and the ones that you guys think he has. And, and he was gonna present it on Monday. And now he says, no, I'm not gonna present it. And you're gonna have to, in, if he gets his way, you're gonna have to wait two and a half years for me to present it. He don't have no evidence. But even if you think he does, he ran, he ran. And now on the debate, he runs again. Who runs away for, I mean, I thought he was the world's greatest debater. Why doesn't he show up and kick their ass? I mean, you guys think he'll kick their ass, right? By the way, I think he'll kick their ass. The other guys are no winners either. DeSantis was like, ah, okay, so why don't you show up? Because you're scared. Right, I mean, this is the man who during a debate told Ted Cruz that his wife is so ugly, no one could ever love her and then had Ted Cruz phone banking for Trump like a month later. I mean, he. what is exactly is he scared about when he's for not going to these debates though? I mean, he'll definitely be able to steamroll these guys unless he's lost even more of his faculties, which I mean, highly likely that he has. But I mean, does he really need them to win over a Republican audience? I don't think so. This I think he's just probably afraid of sticking his foot in his mouth and his lawyers probably don't want him on that debate stage. That's probably what it actually is. If I was Trump's lawyer, which I can't even believe that he still has people who are willing to represent him legally anymore. But if I was his lawyer, I would say no, definitely say as little as possible. Just whatever you're about to say, just say less of it. And then maybe we'll have a shot at this. So yeah. that's why he's not doing it. No, there's no chance in the world that that strategy would work. <laughs> Trump can't help himself. He's gonna verbally vomit everything, every dumb thought that comes into his head. Uh, and you were probably right that his lawyers warned yeah, him about right. the debate too, but he's gotta engage in debates at some point. And look, we're the fairest show in America. And so there's an, of course there's another reason why he doesn't wanna do the debate, he's up 40 points. And people who are up don't wanna do debates. And by the way, Biden's not doing any debates either. And you can call him a coward too, we're fair. Uh, we don't play this only one side is right stuff. And then, uh, but finally, I, there is one person he might be afraid of. He's not afraid of DeSantis and other, uh, weaklings that are already on their knees, like Vivek. Was he gonna be afraid of Vivek? Vivek's like, oh, you're the best, Donnie, I can't believe I'm on the same stage as you. Mom, dad, I'm on the same stage as Donald, I'm on the same stage as Donald. So that he's not worried about any of that. They're just gonna kiss his ass and humiliate themselves. But Chris Christie, uh, he's a little worried about Chris Christie. Because Chris Christie's not gonna play ball and he's gonna he's gonna hit him in the face politically. And, uh, and Trump cannot debate anyone who's smart. Uh, last time Chris Christie chose not to fight him and so did every other Republican. This time Chris Christie wants to fight and Trump doesn't want any piece of that. Yeah, I think what's funny about Chris Christie is that he's he always polls so poorly that there's no way that in his mind he even thinks that he has a shot at winning any of this. So I'm you know, if he's there just to be antagonistic and just to troll, then maybe that's his role in America at this point. That's his role in the United States. He's never going to be president, but he can do this one thing for us. Yes, but I wouldn't be so sure. Um I he's now polling at number 2 in New Hampshire. Uh so here comes Chris Christie. Uh, and Finally. Yeah, so look, Trump could get knocked out by all these trials. I mean, with that verbal diarrhea that he has, he could be in a world of trouble, especially if he takes the stand. So there's tons of landmines out there for Donald Trump that have nothing to do with his political opponents. Uh, but if he goes under, I wouldn't bet against Chris Christie. I know they hate him because he uh, criticizes the beloved, uh, but but he's an actual fighter and the rest of them are incredibly weak. So we'll see.
We'll see how that goes. But there's one person who apparently agrees with me, and that's Donald Trump, because he doesn't want any part of Chris Christie. <laughs> Um, all right, we got to take the break, guys. Uh, when we come back, we've got more news for you, including the Republican war on bankers. No, of course not. On donors, of course not. Uh, on the powerful, on the rich, the people who are oppressing us, of course not. On librarians, they're gonna get those evil librarians. We'll be back. Back on TYT, Jank, Ravana, and Yasmin with you guys. Ray, take it away. Yeah, so this next story has me so angry, I wanna throw my phone across the room and I'm sure by the end of it, or hell, maybe even by the beginning, you'll all be feeling the same way. Because a three judge appellate court panel in the Fifth Circuit issued a decision ending the ability of the medication abortion pill Mifepristone to be received through the mail amongst other things. Now, one of those judges is being called out for receiving payments from the group that brought the case in the first place. And we'll get into more on that later. But first, let's discuss what this ruling means for abortion rights. From AP News, the decision by three judges on the fifth US Circuit Court of Appeals in New Orleans overturned part of a lower court ruling that would have revoked the FDA's 23 year old approval of Mifepristone. But it left intact part of the ruling that would end the availability of the drug by mail. Allow it to be used through only the seventh week of pregnancy rather than the 10th. And require that it be administered in the presence of a physician. Now, I really wanna highlight that administered in the presence of a physician portion. Because Mifepristone is safer than Tylenol and Viagra. So when you have to ask yourself, what is the difference <laughs> between Mifepristone and Tylenol and Viagra? One is specifically a medication for abortion and particularly covers women's reproductive health and the others are not. So <laughs> there is a massive difference in the way that they are treating this medication than they would more dangerous medications. So. Keep that in mind. And also, this type of judicial overreach into the FDA is completely unheard of. And more on that from AP News. There is virtually no precedent for a US court, court, court excuse me, overturning the approval of a drug that the FDA has deemed safe and effective. While new drug safety issues often emerge after FDA approval, the agency is required to monitor medicines on the market, evaluate emerging issues, and take action to protect US patients. Congress delegated that responsibility to the FDA, not the courts, more than a century ago. And it's intuitive because who would you rather be making these decisions? The experts or judges who have no particular expertise in these areas? The answer is clear. Now, the Biden administration does plan on appealing the decision, which means that if SCOTUS decides to take it up, they would be the ones who make the final decision. Jennifer Salvin of the ACLU highlighted how this decision and the potential decision of, of the Supreme Court will harm abortion seekers in an online press conference. She had this to say, if the Supreme Court affirms this decision, it will prevent patients from receiving their medication in the mail in all 50 states in the nation. That means that patients will have to travel often hundreds of miles, especially if they're coming from a state that has banned abortion for the sole purpose of picking up a pill. So there's that, but now let's shift our focus to one judge, namely James Ho. He wrote a concurring opinion, which means he agreed with the outcome of the court, but came to that conclusion in a different way. In fact, Ho believed that Mifepristone should be banned entirely. And to give you an idea what heinous and idiotic things this man believes, here's an excerpt from his concurring opinion. I'll read it in part. It says, it's well established that if a plaintiff has concrete plans to visit an animal's habitat and view that animal, the plaintiff suffers aesthetic injury when an agency has approved a project that threatens the animal. I'll just say, as someone who's gone to law school, graduated law school, it's well established that 
Using that term of phrase in legal writing is absolutely not proper. That was a really long one sentence paragraph that any legal writing professor at any law school would wallop their student upside the head for writing. But I digress, the actual content of what he said in this next paragraph is so much worse than any error he had in his writing. It says this, unborn babies are a source of profound joy for those who view them. Expected parents eagerly share ultrasound photos with loved ones. Friends and family cheer at the sight of an unborn child. Doctors delight in working with their unborn patients and experience an aesthetic injury when they are aborted. Jenk, my blood is boiling. An aesthetic injury because they don't get to delight in seeing ultrasound photos. Okay, so let's talk about activist judges. Because remember how we got into this, they Roe v. Wade. And uh, the right wing has been saying now for decades, a bunch of activist judges uh, decided that it was, that uh, abortion was legal and uh, banning it was unconstitutional because uh, it was in the right to privacy in the Constitution. And they talked about three trimesters and how you can't get it in the third trimester, but you can in the first two in the state's interest, etc. And they said that was too activist. I actually have a lot of sympathy for that argument. And I've said that many times on the show. So now let's look at this case and see if we could find an activist judge. So somehow it's in the Constitution that uh, Mifepristone is okay to be approved by the FDA. But only for seven weeks and not 10 weeks, really? Where, where in the constitution does it say that? And then on top of that, you can approve it, but a doctor has to be present, where, where, where in the constitution does it say that? You can approve it, but you can't send it by mail, where, where? Is it in one of the amendments, is it in one of the articles? Where is it in the constitution? No, they're just making this up 100%. And then you ask, wait, what is the state's interest in this at all? And he comes up with that beauty, man. Well, I think ultrasound pictures are cute. So the state has an interest in aesthetic injuries suffered if you don't see the ultrasound picture. And that's why we're gonna make you have a baby against your will. Are you serious? This is like full blown three ring circus clown. And we haven't even gotten to his corruption yet. Yet this is now we're having, look, in the old days, Politicians are full of crap. One guy would say something that was halfway true and halfway lie. The other guy would say a full lie and we'd have debates over that. Now, idiocy has permeated into the judiciary. And we're not just having you know, intellectual conversations uh, that disguise their actual political motive, which is what judges have been doing for a long, long time. Now we've got morons on the bench going, like, I like little baby pictures and that's an aesthetic injury. And I think that it's not activist, not activist to say seven weeks, but not 10 weeks, do it, but don't do it by mail. Make sure there's a blah, 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 blah. get out of here, man. You get to, they're just, it's a conservative court. Three of them are appointed by Trump, one appointed by George W. Bush. They don't care about the law at all. It's totally unprecedented to say that an executive agency is going to be overruled by the, by the courts in this way. They're just saying this is our political opinion and we're gonna write it as if it's law. And us complaining about activist judges our whole lives, we were full of crap as always. We didn't mean a word of it. Yasmin. Yeah. Yeah, and I think you mentioned it, but this guy, James Ho, he was a Trump appointed judge. And you know, so I think Ray Vanna and I were talking about it earlier in the show or before the show started. I live in Texas, so I think I'm just used to just being disappointed all the time by the things that my state government does, especially when it comes to things like abortion rights and just women's health care in general, health care in general, I should say, not even specific to anybody. But it, it's always disappointing. And all these rulings that they come out with, they always feel so arbitrary, right? You know, seven weeks versus 10, whatever, you know, whatever kind of rules that they have that they put in place, they just pull them out of their, you know, what's. And it's like they just want to make things more inconvenient for people so that we just give up trying to get any of the things done. They do it to us with health care, they do it to us with voting, all kinds of things here. So I'm used to being disappointed. I don't really expect any kind of good thing to happen in my state 
in particular. So whenever I read about rulings like this one, I'm just like kind of numb to it, which is very sad because I'm, how old am I? I'm 34 years old right now, almost 35. If I was gonna have a child, it would be now, right? At this stage in my life. But for some reason, all these Republicans are influencing my personal decision as to whether or not I wanna have a kid right now. And it doesn't make any sense to me. It's so wild to me that all this stuff is happening. And it just so happens to be at a time that's critical, not just for me, but for a lot of other people. You know, they're taking that whole decision, which is my life decision, and taking it out of my hands and out of the hands of so many other people just like myself. And it really, it's it's hard to wrap your head around in, in a lot of ways. And I've told my fiance, if I have a kid, we gotta move. I have to do it outside of Texas. I don't wanna have a child in my home state. This is where I live, I would have to uproot my entire life. But this is such a major decision and they're not gonna let me make it for myself. So there is a very personal aspect to all of these stories that we cover. Except, you know, it's easy to get very upset about it in principle and theory, but it really, all these stories affect actual people's lives. And I think it's important all the time to just come back to it and remember that. And also, I'm gonna make a plug to vote in your local elections. You vote for judges, you vote for people like this in a lot of different ways, you vote for people on the courts. You gotta vote in local elections because this is how it affects you, right? A lot of people only vote for the president, they think that that matters the most. It does. But local is what's gonna get you. That's what you're gonna feel the most. Right, and it becomes even more frustrating, particularly at the federal level, because we don't have that sort of direct say over our judges, which is why it's even more imperative to make sure that you're doing that at the state local level. But it becomes even more frustrating when you realize that in some cases, these decisions are being made by these judges for money, because there's a really strong argument to be made that Judge Ho should never have heard this case at all and absolutely should have recused himself. And the Lever did some excellent reporting on this. They reported that James Ho did not recuse himself from the case, even though his wife, Allison Ho, has regularly participated in events with and accepted speaking fees from the Alliance Defending Freedom, the conservative Christian legal group whose lawyers argued that Mifepristone, the Mifepristone case before his court, according to the judge's financial disclosures. And that name, Alliance Defending Freedom, might sound familiar to a lot of you. Because just last Friday, we covered a story where a judge ordered lawyers to attend the organization's explicitly Christian religious freedom training. Now, the ADF is also the organization that brought the anti-LGBTQ SCOTUS case about designing a website for a theoretical gay couple that never even existed or was getting married. And they were also involved in the Dobbs decision as well. So let's get more into how she was making this money from the ADF. James Ho's financial disclosures show that Allison Ho, a top appellate lawyer at the multinational law firm Gibson Dunn, participated in events with the Alliance Defending Freedom and accepted honoraria or speaking fees every year between 2018 and 2021. The group also paid her travel expenses for some events. The judge's 2022 financial disclosures is not available. So this could have been as recently as last year. We don't know that yet, but it continues on. Allison Ho was received, uh, was paid, excuse me, $3,000 in 2020 for an event listed as the Alliance Defending Freedom Academy and received $1,000 in for another Alliance Defending Freedom event in 2021, according to this disclosure. So this was exceptionally recent. I think it's important to point out that Judge Ho wasn't technically required to recuse himself. Although any person with half a brain can tell you that there is impropriety, at least the appearance of impropriety happening there. But and, and it doesn't mean just because he didn't technically have to do it that we can't highlight how grossly and obviously wrong this is. Now, from that article, the bottom line is that any entity that is putting money in your spouse's bank account raises a potential for impropriety if if you sit in if you sit on, excuse me, one of those cases said Gabe Roth, executive director of Fix the Court, a watchdog group that advocates for federal court reform. The money was put there in the last couple of years. It's not like that's easily Forgettable, and because as Jenk always says, this is the fairest show in America, Judge Ho did defend himself, so I will read that for you all. 
James Ho told the lever in an email, I consulted the judiciary's ethics advisor prior to sitting in the case and was advised that there was no basis for recusal. In any event, Allison's practice is to donate honoraria to charity. Jank, I'll say I don't give a damn. I don't give a damn if she donates the money, which we don't know if that's true or not. I don't give a damn if there wasn't a tech technical basis for recusal. Everyone knows that there is impropriety happening here. I mean, I don't care. This guy was gonna probably rule this way on this case regardless. But it just is logical that if you are getting money from the organization that's bringing the case, you don't get to make the decision on that case. Yeah, it's really a no brainer, but the courts are totally out of control now. There's no accountability. Because guys, look, in this case, do I think that he ruled that way just because his wife got 3,000 bucks in travel a couple of different times. No, as Ray pointed out, I think he was gonna rule that way anyway, he's a knucklehead. And she's at Gibson Dunn, which is a huge law firm, which means she makes a lot of money. That $3,000 is probably not going to sway her. But that's not the point, guys. The point is they got a case in front of you and they put money into your bank account. No, we can't have that. That's obviously the appearance of impropriety. I don't know if you're affected by 3,000 bucks and, and fancy travel, I, but it doesn't matter. You shouldn't allow that to happen because it looks like corruption. And since they're both mega conservatives, him and his wife, you don't need it. You don't need that corruption. You don't need the appearance of corruption, but they do it anyway. And there's no accountability, nothing. Nothing will happen to that guy, nothing's gonna happen to Clarence Thomas and the guys on the Supreme Court. And the Clarence Thomas situation is so much worse because his wife is just paid her entire salary, a very large salary by people that come in front of Clarence Thomas all the time and he doesn't recuse himself. Basically conservatives, whether it's at the presidential level or at the judiciary level now are saying ethics are irrelevant. We don't, we don't care about your values or your ethics or the appearance of corruption or corruption itself, we don't care. We think we're above the law, we're gonna break any law we like and any code that we like because we're Republicans. Yeah, I mean, you said the courts are out of control. That was all by design. You know, we saw the GOP stacking the courts around the country for years leading up to this. We saw all those Trump appointed judges, people who had very, very, very little experience actually judging cases and actually working in law and in the legal system. And now they have positions of authority, of power across the entire country, small towns, big cities, wherever they're in power, they're in control. So everything is rigged, right? If you want to talk about conspiracies, it's not it's proven. You can look it up. We have the evidence. We saw that it was happening. And even just look at the Supreme Court. You can see it there, plain as day for everyone to see. And it sucks that we are stuck with all these rulings that these people have put upon us, right? And the Republicans love to do this whenever they want to pass something that is unethical or even unpopular or maybe doesn't have as much of a legal ground as they would like for it to have. They just kind of play the game and game the system and make sure that all of these ideas, regardless of how popular they are in this supposedly democratic country are put upon a people who doesn't want them, right? If you look around the world, you always see this minority ruling the majority and that's very much what's happening here in this country. But it's less obvious than you would see in a lot of other countries, right? We here in the United States like to think that we're immune to things like that. We like to think that we're immune to corruption. We like to think of ourselves as very ethical people, right? Because we're a Christian nation and we rule based on Christian values or whatever it is that the GOP is telling their people that they do. But the reality and we know it and this has always been the case. This isn't anything new. The reality is that we are not ethical. We do whatever we want and we do it whether whether or not we even have a good justification for it. Even this this um the from James Ho what he was saying, his explanation for why he ruled the way he did, it wasn't even good. What what did he, he call it aesthetic value or whatever? It doesn't even make sense, right? He didn't even have a good way to justify his own ruling. Yeah, last quick thing here guys. Republicans, think about shoe on the other foot. Imagine if George Soros gave him the 3000 gave his wife the 3000 bucks and paid for her travel over and over again. Imagine if George Soros paid a huge salary to the spouse of not Clarence Thomas but Sotomayor, one of the liberal justices. What would you guys think? 
you would definitely think that there was at least at a bare, bare minimum, the appearance of corruption. You can't even pretend that you wouldn't think that. And obviously, that's also true when it applies to conservative justices. All right, we gotta take a break here. When we come back, uh, war on librarians and shockingly good news out of Arkansas. Huh? All right, we'll be right back. On TYT, Jank, Ray, Yasmin with you guys. Also, Zachary Rivenbark, uh, because he just uh, became a Young Turks member and an American hero by hitting the join button below. Chris Birch gifted a membership on YouTube, and Samantha GK uh, uh, and Paper Dragon gifted uh, one on Twitch, and Dave Schmidt 311 gifted two. You guys are all amazing. Thank you for looking out for one another. We love that. Ray, what's next? Yep, the war on librarians. So, everybody, take a look. When you start outlawing books because of your personal religious and moral beliefs in this country, you're, you're going against the Constitution, you're going against what we were founded for. This is a show, and I'm embarrassed for this board. Those were the powerful words of a resident of Campbell County, Wyoming. Where that board decided to fire its longtime public librarian for refusing to remove books conservatives in the community deemed too sexual. Before we go on, Jenk, was that man right about what the Constitution says? Of course. Look, as you're going to see in a second, this had nothing to do with being too sexual. It had everything to do with banning it because it had LGBTQ material in it. And why would you want to ban that? Well, there's only one reason, and that's because of your religious beliefs. And so, uh, in case you're unclear about it, and apparently almost every Republican is unclear about this, the Establishment Clause of the First Amendment says Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. That means you get to exercise your own religion any way you like at your home, but you cannot have the government say, "Oh, the librarian won't take out books that have gay people in them." We hate her because my re fundamentalist religious views is says that there should be nothing mentioned about gay people in a library, uh, and hence the government should do what my religion says. Sorry, but you're in the wrong country. Saudi Arabia might work out for you, Iran might work out for you, but America, we do not establish a religion. So your particular religious beliefs are wonderful for you, but irrelevant for the rest of us and for the government. By the way, I appreciate that brother and all the good people of Wyoming that came out to fight this. Unfortunately, they lost, but at least there's good folks in Wyoming fighting back. Ray, back to you. Yeah, and it, it was great to see him and so many people come out to support her. So let's get into some background on this librarian from HuffPost. Terry Leslie had been an employee of the library system for 27 years, including 11 years as director. According to members of the community in the town of 30,000, she was widely beloved. At the special meeting in which she was dismissed, hundreds of people showed up to support her. So how did this all end up going down? So for two years, the library board and right wing activists had been trying to get Leslie to remove books they were alleging are inappropriate for minors. So some info on that. In the spring of 2021, community members came to the library to complain about alleged sexual content and books in the teen and kids section targeting titles like How Do You Make a Baby by Anna Fisk and Doing It by Hannah Witten. That June, a teen volunteer wrote a Pride Month blog post for the library celebrating LGBTQ authors. And some people living in Gillette pushed back, including a local officer who, official, excuse me, who said it was harmful to the community. And when the library hired Michaela Oz, a children's magician who happened to be transgender for an event a month later, all hell broke loose. So more on the hell that broke loose and the absurdity of the response to that. One longtime library staffer spoke under the condition of anonymity and had this to say. The magician was simply a well renowned magician who was hired for a summer program. Her gender identity was irrelevant. 
But that was the match that lit the tinderbox. So in October of 21, supporters and critics of the library gathered at a board meeting to voice their concerns about the library supposedly providing sexually explicit and abusive material to minors. One woman said during public comment that her personal survey of the teen section indicated that 60% of the books were witchcraft. While another <laughs> said that the library had become an indoctrination center, which I'll say, I think that in this country, any library should be allowed to have books on witchcraft. It's your right, it's your constitutional right to be able to pick that up and read it. But I digress. Leslie claims that some activists actually went to the sheriff's office to try to get her arrested for not removing these witchcraft books. Now, community members challenged 29 books in 2021 and 2022. And she stuck to her guns, Leslie, and absolutely refused to remove them. She said she did it because for one, her belief that a diverse collection of books is crucial to running a successful library. And also because she was worried about being sued for violating the first amendment, which prohibits government sanctioned censorship. She had to say this. I believe the community is harmed by not having access to a wide variety of information. Public libraries are for everyone. Our collection should serve all citizens of the community. So because she upheld the constitution, stuck to her guns, the board voted to fire her. And she did an interview with CNN just yesterday. Here's what she had to say about whether or not the books in her library were actually inappropriate. There is nothing in the library that could be classified as pornography in any way, shape, or form. We do have um, some sex education books and um, biology books, things like that, and um, that are you know are important for um, for youth to have access to in case they have questions. Um, there were some LGBTQ themes in these books. And I and I felt like the LGBTQ part of that was, was a big part of what the complaints from the public were about. Jenk, the party that supposedly loves free speech and is anti-censorship, censoring a public library, not even a school's library, just a public library because they didn't like some of the information in some of the books. Okay, so first of all, mask is off. Uh, they were pretending that this was because they were worried about rumors and worried about protecting the kids when all this started, right? Now, there's not even an allegations of that. For example, the person who was gonna read happens to be transgender. Nobody even knew it, it's just because there's a certain percentage of transgender people in the country. And they're like, oh, it's a transgender person, we hate them. So we don't want them to read to our kids. So wait, there's no allegation of anything inappropriate at all, at all. The only thing that they think is inappropriate is her existence. So mask is off, just admit it, you're bigots. It's okay, it's not okay, but that's your life and that's your choices. But I need you to understand, don't come and tell us, oh, no, no, I don't, I don't mind. And look at how they always phrase it like, I don't mind, like, oh, thank you, we appreciate it. I, no, I don't mind gay people or trans people. No, no, no. I just don't. I just don't want them to you know, like read books or something and, and be in public or something. I, 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 you know, and they're always flaunting things. Uh, yeah, straight people never flaunt anything, right? They never kiss in public. They never hold hands in public. It's that. No, guys, it's super obvious. Sex ed. We've been teaching sex ed for decades in this country. All of a sudden, they're like, oh, LGBTQ people are also in there, and they acknowledge their existence in those books. Oh no, that's it. Just admit. That you're doing this because of hate. Remember, they fired her. The people who were in favor of hate won. There was good people there in Wyoming, but unfortunately, they lost. Okay, so that's point one. Point two is now it's turned into a literal witch hunt because that lady said it was she was worried about witchcraft, and that's why she wanted to fire the librarian. They think she's a witch, and that's why they fired her. Cuckoo for cocoa puffs, like. What am I supposed to, I'm supposed to humor you? She thought 60% of the books in a library in Wyoming, 60% were about witchcraft. Cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs. Do you not see that? Do you, are there, there, apparently there are people in this country, almost all right wingers, now you have to acknowledge that. Almost all right wingers, I don't mean all the right wing, I mean the people who do it are all right wingers. They come in and go, oh, yeah, yeah, witchcraft, man. A gay person, witch, 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 I found a witch. I'm not against gay people. No, you're bigots. It's okay. 
That's your personal opinion, but you now you're firing librarians over it. And the last thing I'll say is, so you're not going after the bankers who are robbing us blind. You're not going after political donors. I mean, look, Republicans claim they care about corruption. I'm here to tell you, you want to take out the private donors like George Soros? I'm with you. Let's go take out all the donors and make sure they never buy our politicians again, right? No, you're not worried about any of that. You're not worried about the powerful that are screwing you. You're worried about librarians? You're worried about librarians and you got a war on librarians. Congratulations, Republicans, you have wonderful priorities. And if you're proud of this, well, all right, well, I guess you belong in the Republican Party. Yes. Yeah, can I just say discrimination against witches is also not okay. But you're absolutely right. The fact that this happened in a public library and not a school library completely destroys all of their previous book banning arguments. All whatever reasons that they had, those are out the window now. And you know, book bans really grind my gears for lack of a better idiom right now. <laughs> um, I don't know why people don't understand that reading a book, even owning a book, having it on your personal library, it doesn't mean that you're endorsing the ideas within the book. It doesn't mean that you agree with the ideas in the book. It just means that you have been exposed to the ideas within the book. And that's really telling because that's what they're actually afraid of, right? These are the same people who read the same book over and over again and have convinced themselves that that's all they need to know about the world and history and science and morality. It's all in that one book and they're terrified of everything else. And that's why their worldviews are so myopic and fine, you know, live your life, but I wanna read, I wanna read all of it. And also what counts as porn? You know, Nicholas Sparks books have sex scenes in them. Are they banning those too? I don't know. Time for one more story, Ray, so hit it. All right, so some interesting news coming out of Arkansas. So the Arkansas Department of Education or the DOE announced just before the beginning of this school year that students may not receive class credit for taking the AP African American Studies course. But instead of backing down, and this is the good part of this, the six schools who had originally planned to teach the course this coming year have announced that they are not gonna move it from remove it from their curriculum. They are gonna go forward and teach the this class as they intended to. So here's how it all went down. Now, last Friday, the Arkansas DOE notified teachers that AP African American Studies may not count for credit anymore. Schools were still allowed to teach it if they wanted, though. Now, the timing couldn't have been worse because the school year for this year had just started this Tuesday. Now, the timing was likely deliberate, but that's just a strong suspicion. Can't confirm that for sure. But to add insult to injury, the Arkansas DOE informed teachers that the state would not give students any financial assistance with the $98 fee that comes with the AP test. And the state usually covers the cost of the AP tests for the students. Now, this move wasn't completely unexpected because Sarah Huckabee Sanders, who's the governor of Arkansas, ugh, I can't believe that that's the case, but she is. She built her platform on culture war grievances. Such as these. Now, just as an example, she signed an executive order on her very first day in office that bans indoctrination and critical race theory in school. It's really good when these state governments pass these really broad laws that even they don't quite understand what they mean. But this course, as USA Today describes it, doesn't even seem to contain either of the things that they're using as the reasoning for, you know, for not giving credit for this class. So from USA Today, AP African American Studies is an interdisciplinary college level course that covers themes ranging from early African empires and the transatlantic slave trade to reconstruction and black power and pride. Shortly after Florida Governor Ron DeSantis denounced the course in January, 
the college board removed or made optional topics such as intersectionality and the Black Lives Matter movement, which I think is harmful to these students because if they're getting credit for a class that they would take in college, there's not a single <laughs> African American studies class at any university that wouldn't be teaching about those topics. But I digress. The state's excuse for derailing the course was that the course is still in its pilot phase, which is when the college board offers courses in a select number of high schools and sometimes changes the curriculum before finalizing the course. Now, the Arkansas DOE also noted that the state has a regular African American history course available. I mean, Jake, this is obviously a grotesque attack on teaching black history in this country. I don't care if they have different African American studies courses available. It's not the AP course. It's not the one that you know they need to take to get college credit for. Yeah, look, you have to teach actual history. And the Republicans, there's a reason why they're attacking teachers and librarians. Because they want to replace actual history with propaganda. So let's minimize what happened during slavery because it hurts our feelings. So I don't know why it hurts your feelings, you didn't do it. Why are you taking it on like it's your responsibility? And so they, they're trying to replace it with, their version of reality, which isn't true. So look, I love that the teachers in Arkansas fought back here. And Arkansas is a complicated place. So now we live in a world where everything is perceived as blue state or red state. But remember, first of all, the teachers are doing this also in Little Rock. Little Rock was the first school in the South or generally in that area to get forced desegregation. So after all these years, the Republican governor wanted to go back to a situation where we were going backwards on civil rights. And the teacher stood up and said, not on our watch. I love that. And and remember, Arkansas elected Bill Clinton, not when he was an elitist, but back when they thought he was a populist as governor. So and Arkansas very recently passed a higher minimum wage at over two thirds of people voting yes. So there are actually a lot of good people in Arkansas who are willing to fight back against this. And here is a group of them that fought back and for now have won and are defying the powerful. So I love it, that's the populist root of Arkansas. And at least these folks have found it and it is rare good news. And I, I, I can't thank them enough for standing their ground, Yasmin. Yeah, Jenk, you're absolutely right. And I love this story because of exactly that. You know, as a blue person in a red state, I feel like I'm always telling non Texans that there are a lot of progressive and liberal Texans, but for whatever reason, they keep trying to tamp down our voices and make sure that we're not represented accurately. So I feel like no one believes me when I tell them that, but I love seeing blue victories in red states because I promise you, those victories are hard fought and hard won. But this whole thing kind of reminds me of there's like that Christian propaganda movie, God is Dead. It had Kevin Sorbo, Hercules was in it. And there's a scene at the beginning depicting a college philosophy course. And it's so obvious that no one involved in making that movie has ever actually sat in a college classroom. I don't know what these people think is actually happening in college courses. I don't know how they think these things are being taught. But they really seem very misguided or misinformed. And I don't know if they've ever gone to college or what. It's hard for me to imagine that so many people have not gone to college. But college courses do not function the way that they seem to think they do. It's not propaganda. You know, you you tend to get a pretty balanced factual account of things in college classrooms, or there's at least discussion about certain things, right? There's never a professor who's just like, you know, spoon feeding you and forcing ideas down anyone's throat. So I don't like that the things that they tell people to be afraid of are the wrong things that they're telling people to be afraid of. And unfortunately, well, they know what they're doing, but unfortunately, the people that they're targeting don't realize that they're being targeted, don't realize that they're literally being lied to. It's not even a matter of opinion at this point that you are being lied to. That's not what's going on. That's not what this is. People still think CRT is being taught in like elementary schools. It's not like just factually it isn't. So anyway, I know we're out of time. Yeah, so everybody check out Ravana and Yasmin on Rebel Headquarters. You guys are gonna love it. We've got a whole nother hour for you guys, including uh, the Nick Fuentes fan who decided to take on a uh, Jewish MMA fighter, how'd that turn out for him? I think you're gonna wanna find out. 
Ray and Yasmin, thank you so much, guys. Well, and uh, thanks so much. Yeah, love to see you next time. Everybody else, stick around. We'll be right back. Thanks for listening to the full episode of The Young Turks. Support our work, listen ad-free, access members-only bonus content, and more by subscribing to Apple Podcasts at apple.co slash TYT. I'm your host, Cenk Uger, and I'll see you soon.